Uh, Nivedita ma'am, can we start the session? Hello, ma'am. Can we start the session? Rishi? Five, five, duck. बोलते Hello. Hello. Screen is visible. Yeah, yeah, my screen is visible. Yes, yes, screen is visible. Thank you. Can I start okay. now? 
uh, yes ma'am uh, uh, kiran sir can you start the recording please thank you uh, very good afternoon to everyone uh, today i will be discussing basically it's a recapitulation of the dolitegravir based regimens uh, we are going through the transition plans already and uh, this is just a, a recapitulation for us to uh, get our points what we need to remember as well, the transition phase is going very fast forward and uh, this uh, session may help uh, some of the, uh, some of us if not all to again go through the uh, important file and the salient points now uh, what is the content of my discussion today it's an introduction to the dolutegravir based regimen into the national aids control program the pharmacology of dolutegravir and the benefits of dtg i will be discussing about the dtg based regimens in the first second and the third line art uh, dtg in special special situations like the hiv tb co infections and the women in reproductive age group and my last discussion will be about dtg based art as post exposure prophylaxis or pep now uh, why dolutegravir has been introduced into the art regimen under napo it's a speedy uh, change over a transition which, which has taken place over the last almost one and a half year and uh, the reason why dolutegravir was selected as one of the choices drugs in the art regimen now uh, we know that a dolutegravir has a very rapid viral suppression it achieves viral suppression sooner uh, sooner or uh, than efavirenz and uh, sorry and uh, this uh, efavirenz achieves a uh, suppression by 12 weeks of uh, duration and dolutegravir has been seen to uh, suppress the viral uh, count by many minimum of uh, it takes around 4 weeks of time and that by this 4 weeks of time there is complete viral suppression so now uh, what we have to do is a uh, we need to understand that why dolutegravir was chosen it's basically the main points are rapid viral suppression fewer toxicities more potent as a regimen minimum drug interactions as i discussed that rapid viral suppression this is a remarkable drug dolutegravir suppresses the viral load by just 4 weeks of in time so that it's a very short duration a very handy uh, step to bring my patient to a virally suppressed state and as we know the viral suppression is the key marker which improves health and immunity of the patient compared to efavirenz which took around 3 months of time there is fewer toxicities and side effects minimal discontinuations are noted with dolutegravir less than with efavirenz rash is there but it's lesser than other regimens of nnrti group and there is neuropsychiatric events there is uh, neuropsychiatric events with dolutegravir but that is also much much lesser than efavirenz so the discontinuity as has been seen with majority studies is the discontinuation of dolutegravir due to rash or due to neuropsychiatric events are much lesser ranging from 2 to 5% as compared to 5 to 35% in efavirenz while insomnia is the only reported significant side effect of dolutegravir uh, but that that too has been uh, um, nullified by several other studies i will be discussing in my in the next slides as a more potent regimen dolutegravir has been known to be the most potent regimen because you know this art drug has very little propensity to go into resistance that is if i want to elaborate it like this that if other drugs like zidovudine or tenofovir were being taken by a patient intermittently with uh, poor adherence compared to that uh, uh, dolutegravir in, in any regimen gives a, a higher uh, it's a, it has a very high genetic barrier and as a result, result of this dolutegravir gives result uh, the resistance uh, emergence of resistance is much less now minimal drug interactions i will be talking about currently recommended uh, there is a very little drug interaction with dolutegravir and currently we recommend increasing the dolutegravir dose from 50 mg once daily to 50 mg twice daily with rifampicin as we know that rifampicin has a cytochrome p450 inducing capacity so with rifampicin there is a danger of the uh, low dosage or the low pharmacokinetic um, dose of the other uh, drugs so this uh, to minimize this therapy, sub therapeutic level of the other drugs what we need to do is 
we need to uh, double the dose of dolutegravir. Uh, so high genetic barrier is there. Effective against HIV-2, dolutegravir is one of the major plus points, and there is a harmonization across the patient populations. So dolutegravir was chosen one and a half years back by the NACO and uh, by NACO and also by several other Western countries. And this has been uh, seen to be one of the fastest in viral suppression. This has minimum or fewer side effects. It is a most, much more potent regimen and it has minimum drug interactions also. Now talking about the rapid and sustained efficacy of viral suppression, in the single study, it was seen that among around 833 patients, the dolotegravir uh, demonstrated statistically superior efficacy versus tenofovir, emprostatabine, and efavirenz. And the superior efficacy was defined as 88% undetectable viral load at 48 weeks of time. That is around one year of time. And 80% undetectable viral load at 96 weeks of time, that is approximately two years of time. And this versus is a comparison which was done between dolutegravir, abacavir, and ramivudin on one hand, and tenofovir, emtricetabine, and irofavirins on the other arm. Now, dolutegravir, as I said, achieves viral suppression much sooner than efavirenz. It is an average of four weeks that is taken by dolotegravir to suppress the viral load and in comparison to efavirenz, which takes around 12 weeks. Now, this is a graph which again, uh, statistically, it shows very clearly why dolotegravir is superior. The, 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 same, uh, the, the same study. Now, see, there are two lines. One is the uh, mauve color or the violet line, and another one is the yellow line. The yellow line is the tenofovir, emtricetabine, and the efavirenz bar, and the other uh, ash line, sorry, the ash colored line is the, uh, the, uh, the one above is the dolotegravir, abacavir, and lamivudin line. Now, as we see that the y-axis has proportion with the HIV RNA, and the x-axis has the number of days in weeks. And now, if we closely look at this graph, it will show that the dolotegravir arm had a much faster viral suppression at around four weeks of time. We see that the line is shooting up where the viral suppression is concerned. That is much faster and much earlier in dolotegravir, that is the gray line. And comparatively with the tenofovir arm, the, 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 up, the uh, graph is slightly slanting and slightly it, it is taking over. It is come by 24 weeks of time. We see that the graph shows sustained viral suppression. Rest of the graph, uh, it uh, it is it shows as a shows that the dolutegravir is superior, but uh, not much efficacy uh, uh, difference compared to tenofovir. But the major efficacy that uh, uh, influences is the first four weeks. Now, uh, according to the single study, where it was uh, this 833 patients were compared in, it, between the two arms of dolotegravir, abacavir, amazidin on one hand, and tenofovir, intracetabine, and efavirenz on the other hand, we see that there was 2% via uh, versus 10% discontinuation due to the adverse events at 48 weeks, and 3% versus 11% discontinuation due to adverse events at 96 weeks. So and our conclusion was naturally drawn that the dolotegravir arm had a much lesser side effect. It was generally well tolerated than the efavirenz arm because we know as a, we have been using efavirenz for quite some time in the ART centers. The CNS side effects of efavirenz, some hepatotoxicity with efavirenz, these were alarming signs. And the most common was the CNS one which uh, really hampered the adherence of the patients. Now this 2% and 3%, as we see, dolotegravir does not have side effects, that's not true. But the incidence of side effects is very low compared to ifavirenz. Now the single study, the spring study, the flamingo and the sailing study, all have uh, together given this outcome that dolotegravir has a high barrier to resistance. These studies more or less they continued for two years or three years at a stretch. And there was only minimum amount of resistance that was seen with dolotegravir 
it uh, showed a very high genetic barrier. And as we know, that high genetic barrier is the major, uh, major catch. That is something we want for all our patients because we know for lifetime therapies, what happens is patients really tend to miss some of their doses. So we, we want to prescribe only those drugs. We want to select only those drugs which have a high genetic barrier so that one or two skips of medicine will not result in minor or major mutations. Now coming to the potency versus resistance graph, uh, we see that on the left-hand side, we have zidovudine and stavudine, tenofovir, TAF, abacavir, 3TC, and emtricitabine. All these drugs we see along with nevirapine, they have a low genetic barrier. Having a low genetic barrier, what, uh, they, what happens is they result in the resistance pat the patterns developing first you as we know that the minor mutations happen and the minor mutations they accumulate or accumulate to give rise to the major mutations so the drugs which are on the left hand side of the graph they have a higher propensity to develop resistance so missing one or two pills every week or uh, every month will result in minor or major mutations but Dolotegravir, as we see, is on the top right half of the graph, along with lopinavir and darunavir. So dolotegravir, lopinavir, darunavir, these are the drugs which have a high genetic barrier. That means that the potency and resistance, the potency is high, that is one plus point, but the resistance is also achieved only after a gross adherence is, gap is there. That is a patient who is missing one or two doses does not uh, develop resistance, is happy to be in the same regimen. And we as physicians, we are also happy that our patients are not failing on the dolotegravir or darunavir or lopinavir. Now, the DTG uh, also has its own share of problems. Like we know, there was a lot of controversy about, about DTG and pregnancy and newborn because uh, there were study, big studies which were telling us that DTG really causes some amount of neural tube defects. Now, in Botswana, the large study was done where uh, it showed that there was around 0.9% of neural tube defect. And uh, this study was done on a uh, cumulative cohort of 426 women. Now, this neural tube defect uh, declined when the study continued over a period of time. And this decline, it declined from 0.9% to 0.9%. Uh, it's, uh, it declined from 0.9% to 0.3%. But uh, the basically what happened is, uh, even if it declined, it was much, much higher than efavirenz side effect. So because efavirenz, uh, we know that the neural tube defect risk of if, uh, defect with efavirenz is only 0.05%. That is in uh, 1,000, if it, it is a case of 1,000 uh, childbirths, it is only, uh, the, there is chance of only uh, if in 10,000 child birth, there is a chance of only five uh, women having been affected with the neural tube defect, the newborn. Uh, so uh, here we see it's 0.9 person, that is nine out of every thousand children may be affected with the neural tube defect when it is when they, the concern is with the dolotegravir regimen. So uh, it is safe to initiate uh, dolotegravir uh, as, a, as the cohort is expanding. And the studies are showing lesser amounts of neural tube defects. The outcomes are improving. But uh, these, uh, the Botswana study, as it is, uh, if we rely on this study, uh, our, our patients, our pregnant women, those who want to conceive, they should be counseled about dolotegravir side effect before we go ahead with their regimens. Now, effective contraception should be offered to adult women and adolescent girls of childbearing age or potential. DTG can be prescribed for adult women and adolescent girls of childbearing age or potential who wish to become pregnant or who are not otherwise using or accessing consistent and effective contraception if they have been fully informed of the potential increase in the risk of neural tube defects at conception and until the end of the first trimester. In case a woman does not want to initiate TLD after adequate counseling, she should be initiated on TLE. If a woman is identified to be pregnant after the first trimester, DTG should be initiated or continued for the duration of the pregnancy. 
Now, as I said that neural tube defect is a serious issue. We know that anencephaly, spina bifida, meningocele, meningomyelocele, that is the defects of the brain and the spinal cord, these appear. And uh, if a woman, after counseling her, she does not want to take that 0.3% risk, that, then that is uh, three in 1,000 chances of uh, three being uh, having the defect in 1,000. Uh, as a mother, she doesn't want to um, go for that risk. Surely, we will not initiate all the in that mother. We will ask, ask, uh, continue with efavirenze as her first-line regimen. But if a scenario happens like this, that a pregnant mother comes after the first trimester of pregnancy for initiation of ART, then we can go for dolotegravir because dolotegravir uh, induced neural tube defect. And that is, as we know, that organogenesis happens as the in the first trimester of pregnancy and the spinal column and the brain development, all, all these organogenesis takes in the first trimester. So after organogenesis, uh, the dolotegravir induced neural tube defect does not arise. So after the first trimester of pregnancy, we can safely go ahead with dolotegravir. But still, there is an issue that if the mother is not willing to go for any, any of these side effects, and after even uh, after good counseling that, uh, she does not want to take the risk, she should be offered to take efavirenz as the NNRTI backbone. Now, mechanism of action of dolotegravir. Uh, this is a ARV chart. Uh, we know that there are uh, almost six to seven classes of ARV drugs. One is the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitor, and that is tenofovir. And there is a fusion inhibitors in fovitide, then we have the NNRTI or the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. We have integrase inhibitor, CCR5 entry inhibitors, and the protease inhibitors. Now, dolotegravir is uh, in the middle of the chart. Basically, it is an integrase inhibitor. We are quite aware with other types of uh, ARV drugs, that is the NRTI, NNRTI, and the PI. And dolotegravir or raltegravir is new into the ART regimen under NAPO and both are integrase inhibitor. Now I will come to what is an integrase inhibitor. Now th these are the target points where, suppose this is a human host cell, and uh, this is, these are the target points where and how the virus attacks the human host cell and how it enters the host, and then the transcription occurs and the, viri the virions or the baby viruses are released out, out of the cell. So as we know that we have the CXCR receptor and the CCR5 receptor, and these two receptors are there on the surface of the cell. The virus binds to these receptors, and after binding, it helps the virus to absorb into the cell. So our drugs like the CCR5 receptor antagonist, as we know, the Maraviroc, and then food and fluvitide, these drugs, what they do is they inhibit the CCR5 receptor. They uh, attach themselves to the CCR5 inhibitor. As after attachment, they indirectly block the virus to uh, being attached to the CCR to the cell wall. So what happens is the drugs attach themselves, and fluvitide or maravira, whichever is the case, they attach themselves to the receptor and the receptor gets blocked by the drug and the receptor is not no more available for the virus to attach and penetrate the cell. Now, the next step is the reverse transcription. That is the reverse transcriptase inhibitors. As we know, we have the NNRTI and NRTI. Now, after entering the cell, the virus has an RNA that is HIV RNA and reverse transcription occurs. That is an RNA duplicates to form a DNA, as we have, if we can recall that five prime, three prime transcription, as we knew, no, those things happen. And from a single stranded RNA, DNAs are produced. This is the process of reverse transcription because it happens reverse from the three prime. Once it goes from the three prime to the five prime and then back from the five to the three prime end. So this reverse transcription, that is formation of the DNA, HIV DNA, is blocked by the reverse transcriptase enzyme inhibitors like the zidovudin, tenofovir, abacavir, lamivudin, and ifavirenz and nevirapine. 
Now the next uh, group of drug is the integrase inhibitors. What happens is this HIV DNA, it now tries to enter the nucleus of the human cell. It imbibes itself or it gets incorporated with the human DNA. Uh, so so it, in, uh, it makes a space to get lodged inside the human DNA in such a matter that the messenger RNA and the, we know that our DNA duplicates, it multiplies and, the, it, and to uh, give rise to the baby cells. And in the similar way, when my DNA is multiplying, at the same time, it is also multiplying the HIV DNA. And this is done by the mRNA. So the mRNA gives rise to long chains of peptides. These long chains of peptides are cleaved um, by the protease enzyme and the protease enzyme cleaves the long chains of peptides and each new budding cell gets a small, small content of the peptide or the protein. And this new RNAs, they develop and they break up into the baby cells. Now, the integration of the HIV DNA into the host human DNA is done by the enzyme integrase. And this integrase enzyme is inhibited by our drugs like dolotegravir and raltegravir. This step is blocked by these drugs. So the HIV DNA, however count it is there in the cell, it does not incorporate into the host DNA and thereby it is not able to produce its own smaller virions or the babies. Now we know that there are protease inhibitor. We, we rampantly use the protease inhibitor, one of the best drugs we have, we have known till date. And these Drugs are the lopinavir, atazanavir, darunavir, and nitonavir. These drugs, they have the inhibition, they have the capacity to inhibit that protease enzyme. Without the protease, it's a scissor like the protease enzyme acts like a scissor. It cleaves the long chains of peptide to smaller peptide chains. And without this cleaving, the long chain of peptides remain as it is, and the long chains are basically useless and thereby the virions or the baby viruses are not produced. I hope it's clear. So there are basically fusion inhibitors, that is those drugs which are acting outside the cell at the level of the receptors. They are blocking the receptors by binding themselves. Then we have the reverse transcriptase inhibitors, which are blocking RNA to DNA. So third, we have the integrase inhibitors, which are blocking integration of the viral DNA into the human DNA. And the fourth, we have the most important, one of the most important is the protease inhibitors, which obstruct the protease enzyme, the block the protease enzyme, thereby obstructing the cleavage of the long peptide chains. And the blockage of, and the long peptide chains remain as it is, and there's a, these useless chains are no help for the virus to replicate. Now, uh, DTG, as we know, we, it, it also has its own share of adverse events and drug interactions. The side effects of DTG are mainly insomnia, headache, dizziness, tiredness, and these are the four CNS symptoms, as we can see mostly. This insomnia, headache, dizziness, uh, to some extent, hypersomnolence is also there with DTG, but these are the CNS side effects. Whatever the amount of these side effects, it is much, much lesser than efavirenz. And there is some amount of tiredness, allergic reactions. Uh, there are allergic reactions. We have seen a few, few cases. And there is DTG-associated weight gain also. Uh, the weight gain is significant. It is not, not, not to be neglected because uh, we have seen most of our patients, they are coming with almost a 10% to 15% rise increase in weight by three to four months of DTG therapy. So WHO recommends that... Uh, as we cannot stop DTG from the ART regimen, we, we don't want to take away such a vital drug from the ARV regimen. What we can do is we can, ask my, we can ask our patients to go for a slightly low calorie healthier diet and do some exercises to manage their weight. Now the drug interactions with DTG, there are a few interactions only, nothing major, but still uh, we need to remember as physicians what are the drug interactions with DTG. We know that antimalarial agent, uh, amodiaquine, it is there. It should not be used with uh, DTG. Again, uh, we have carbamazepine, an antiepileptic drug. Uh, here also, if we are using carbamazepine, we can use a double dose of DTG or we can use some other anticonvulsant agent. 
phenytoin and phenobarbitone. Uh, here, uh, the DTG can be used as a double dose or alternative anticonvulsant agent can be chosen. Dophilitide, antiarrhythmic agent, is not in much use nowadays. It should not be used with DTG. Metformin, we know that uh, metformin, uh, there was a big controversy what to do with metformin. Should we stop metformin from the oral hypoglycemic regime? No. What happens is metformin becomes slightly oversensitive when used with DTG. So we should be very cautious and do not use more than 1,000 milligram of metformin once daily. That is uh, metformin, more than 1,000 milligram daily will lead to a, a, a sudden drop in the glycemic status of the patient and we don't want that uh, so with metformin the the, uh, the blood sugar should be monitored very closely if we are using dtg along with it and then there is a polyvalent cation products containing aluminium cal calcium iron magnesium and zinc and uh, that is these drugs are mostly used as aluminum hydroxide antacids calcium we know iron that is the supplements magnesium is also supplement and zinc is the most common multivitamin component. These drugs can be used. It should be used at least two hours before or six hours after DTG. So the, the best way to uh, counsel our patients is we cannot really uh, choose, uh, sorry, we cannot really ask our patients to go through the ingredient of a drug, go to the in, uh, details of the prescription. So the best way to avoid drug interaction is um, tell your patient to avoid outside medicines post sunset so that and take his um, uh, ART with DTG after dinner. So what happens is automatically there is a gap of four, five to four hours. And this is the easiest way to tell our patients because we have to uh, un make them understand in some way that is leg legible for everyone. So uh, aluminum and zinc and magnesium will not be uh, exactly possible for patients to remember. Some will not understand at all. So what we will do is we will ask our patients not to consume outside medicines after 6 p.m. And if they have any antihypertensives, any oral hypoglycemic agents or other drugs like uh, psychiatric medicines and something else, we can ask them to show the physician at the RT center the strip they are taking every, every day or in, in continuing for, for quite some time. And they, only after sure, just a recheck, we can continue with those medicines. And we know that rifampicin uh, is a cytochrome P450 inhibitor, as I said, and rifampicin uh, twice daily, uh, if, if we use rifampicin, DTG has to be taken twice daily because otherwise there will be a sub-therapeutic level of DTG, which will lead to resistance. It will not affect rifampicin in any way. Uh, the rifampicin will act as it is, only the DTG dose has to be doubled. Now, under the national program, we have seen that there has been several changes for the last one and a half years, and DTG has been in, uh, implemented. Uh, it has been uh, absorbed in the first line, second line, and third line. The changes have been very fast. It's really difficult for some, some of us. And so this is a recap again into what is the new first line, new second, and the new third line regimens. Now, this transition, a DTG-based regimen for Treatment of HIV positive adults, adolescent and children, we know. For children, uh, DTG is being given for only those uh, who are having a weight of more than 20 kg and age more than six years. Those are the children who are eligible for DTG. Dalajogavir based regimens will be the preferred regimen in the national program for new PLHIV as well as already on ART PLHIV. As I said in my previous slides, the fastest uh, viral suppression seen in the four weeks of time, it gives a, a significantly better quality of life to the patient. It reduces the chances of opportunistic infections. Yes, but it also gives rise to some amount of IRIS as we know. But leaving that aside, DTG is the preferred regimen in all new PLHIV and also on already on ART PLHIV. Selection of appropriate DTG-based regimen would depend on the viral load suppression status of PLHIV and current ARV drugs being used. We will be selecting uh, step by step what was the previous first, first line, what can we give now, and that I will come into uh, through my next slide. Now, the PLHIV on various ARV regimens will be gradually shifted to dolopegravid-based regimens in a phased manner. Transition plan would be based on the drug stocks availability, 
and NACO has been issuing office orders as we know from time to time for the transition of ETG based regimens. Now the new guidelines, as we know that uh, what will be given to a patient who is uh, around more than 10 years of age, weight more than 30 kg, the regimen will be tenofovir, lamivudin and dolopregravir 300, 350 as we all know, commonly known as TLD. One tablet to be taken once at bedtime or any other fixed time every day for, as per the patient's convenience. Uh, this is a very superior drug. Why? Because here we do not need to bother about the HIV 1 or 2 reports. We do not need to really see his hepatitis B and C profile because it is active against hepatitis B, it is active against HIV 1, 2, and, and or both. And uh, we need, you know, do not need to see into a mother who was previously exposed to a single dose nevirapine in the past or not. All inclusive, we can give TLD to all patients who are just above 10 years and above 30 kg of body weight. Only the only factor we need to keep in mind is, as I said, about the women of childbearing age. If they want to conceive, if they want to have a family, then we need to counsel them. And if the counseling uh, in, if after counseling, we find that the mother is apprehensive, is uh, not very ready to go for DTG as it uh, causes the neural tube defect, we will always give her the option of going for ifaviral. Now for all adults and adolescents, then coming to the regimens that is ART naive adults and adolescents, the latest guideline says, as I said, ALD, that is if, a, if it can be an adult or a child also who is less than 30 kg, then the uh, abacavir will be replacing tenofovir because as we know that tenofovir needs to be given in um, a body weight more than 30 kg. And all patients having a high creatinine values that is uh, having some amount of renal compromise for those patients also we will be avoiding tenofovir, we will go for abacavir. And uh, here we know that lamivudin dose adjustment is needed if the EGFR or the clearin creatinine clearance goes below 30. Now the special situations are like PLHRD who is on rifampicin containing ATT, as I said, uh, if that patient will be getting tenofovir, lamivudin and dolotegravir once in the evening and an extra dose of dolotegravir 50 mg in the morning. And this uh, extra dose of dolotegravir will be continued two weeks post the post completion of the ATT regimen. This is also very important because as we know that rifampicin clearance from the systemic system of our body takes around 10 to 12 days. So to be on the safest side, we will continue this extra dose of dolotegravir two weeks also two weeks post the completion of ATT so that all the remnants of rifampicin are washed off and rifampicin, the residual rifampicin also does not cause any damage to the therapeutic blood level of dolotegravir. I hope I am clear on this issue. Females in reproductive age group who opt out of tenofovir, lamivudin and dolotegravir should be given TLE. If mothers are not convinced about uh, the risks and uh, the pros and cons, they are not convinced about it. And uh, a, a mother rightfully also has uh, the, um, she should be given the choice. She should be given the choice and she should be rightfully given the um, scope of choosing her regimen. Because if you know, we have a mother who is having an, a newborn with anencephaly, we do not really want that. It is a traumatic stress for the mother and for the whole family. So uh, what we need to do is we really need to understand that we cannot, the force our mother to, to take dolotegravir if she at all feels that three out of thousand one is uh, also a great risk. So she we should always give her the uh, voluntary, uh, the, we should give her the, the right to choose, I think. And the, in those cases, we will be replacing dolotegravir with ifavirin. And ifavirin, if it is contraindicated, that is if the mother is HIV 2 or HIV 1 and 2 or has prior exposure to single drug uh, nevirapine or has prior, prior exposure to an NRTI, then we will go ahead with TAL and LPVR. Now, the latest first line regimen changes, uh, I've gone, uh, I've used abbreviations, I'm sorry for that because otherwise the chart would be very clumsy. Now, uh, 
on the left hand side we have the present first line regimens the viral load status the revised first line and the remarks now the present first line regimens as we know uh, we are receiving oms the uh, the guidelines about these things if a person is on first line with ifavirenz or nevirapine based regimens and with a tenofovir or zidovirin or zidovirin or abacavir backbone then if the viral load status is undetectable then we can smoothly shift over to tld that is tle tln will go to tld ale aln will go to tld zle zln will go to tld also but provided that the viral load is suppressed now if we are going to tld the first rosh uh, we uh, have to see that the, if the mother is pregnant or the, uh, the mother is about to plan her family then she has the right to opt out if uh, we are shifting from aln to tld we have to check the renal profile the hepatitis b status because we know that tenofovir and lamivudin were both active against hiv and hepatitis both so if we are withdrawing tenofovir without uh, if you if at any point of time we are withdrawing tenofovir then it what happens is there is a flaring of the hepatitis profile so for from aln to tld we will also check the hepatitis b status here we are introducing tl tenofovir uh, that flare doesn't arise certainly to tld here also we will uh, look into the renal profile because we know that tenofovir causes proximal tubular nephropathy and uh, this proximal tubular nephropathy on a long term basis may lead to renal damage and the first line if a mother if a, sorry if a plhiv is on first line with lpvr that is an alternate first line that plhiv will also be shifted to tld regimen we have to check for any contraindication to t if at all is there and but the only criteria is they will do at least one viral load which will show that the patient is virally suppressed now the second line regimens the latest second line regimens as we all know from the guidelines uh, we have here the first line current first line is on the left failing on and the second line and the remarks i i'll elaborate now if a patient had a first line with zidovudin and he has failed on in an rti pi based first line then the second line will be dolutegravir i will again repeat if the patient has a first line with zidovudin and suppose zln or zl lpvr he will go to tld if there is any contraindication to use tenofovir that is any renal compromise and we will go for ald so a zidovudin containing first line failing with an nnrti or pi will go to tld a tenofovir containing first line tenofovir and nabacavir containing first line with failure on in an rti by pi based regimen will also go to zld but if the hemoglobin is less than 9 we have to go for dtg lpvr i will again repeat the second uh, second row tenofovir abacavir containing first line with backbone of in an rti or pi that is tle or tl lpvr ale or lpvr these will all be shifted to zld that is the patient has failed we have to remember that is these patients have failed so i cannot continue on tenofovir any more so tenofovir will be replaced by zidovudin and if zidovudin cannot be given in cases of anemia then we will go for dolutegravir with lopinavir now the third row tld if a patient is already on a first line with tld and he is showing failure on that regimen what will we do we will shift that patient to zl atvr so t is being replaced by z and d is being replaced by atvr but here also we have to see that the hemoglobin is more than 9 if it is less than 9 we will go for dtg twice daily with atvr now there here is a catch there we gave him the same dtg which he was failing on in the first line i am talking about the third row we are giving dtg twice daily but the patient was already exposed to first line dtg but it has been seen in several studies that DT, dtg as it has a very high genetic barrier it still remains to act and a double dosing of dtg 
will restore the viral suppression. So TLD continues as DTG ATVR if the patient has a history of anemia. Now the third point, the third row is ZLD. ZLD uh, will be uh, shifted to TLATVR, no issues with that. Only the renal profile needs to be checked. Multi-NRTI exposed patients, NNRTI based first line, that's a DTG, that they will go to DTG ATVR. So multi-NRTI exposed, what do we mean by that? A patient is exposed to both zidovudin, abacavir, and tenofovir at the same time, with some prob probably ifavirins or nevirapin. So these patients, we cannot give zidovudin, tenofovir, or abacavir. So they have to be directly shifted to second line with DTG ATVR. Again, multi-NRT exposed at the same time PI-based regimen. This is a very uh, classic case. Uh, we don't find these in our day-to-day -day life easily, but there are some cases. Suppose a patient was having a intolerance to NNRTI. He had a, a stage four uh, Steven Johnson type rash with ifavirins or nevirapin. We could not give him nevirapin or ifavirins. He had to be on the PIs. At the same time, he was due to several reasons of anemia or some other reason. He is exposed to both zidovirin and tenofovir. So zidovirin and tenofovir is gone on one arm, and the PIs are also exposed. The patient is also exposed to PI on the other arm. In these cases, we will be shifting to DTG and darunavirinavir in the second line. So our third line, previous sec third line regimen becomes his second line in this case. Any PLHIV co-infected with TB will receive twice daily dose of DTG. I am uh, I am repeating this again and again because we really need to be foolproof. We do not, do not want to make mistakes because if we are giving ATT without doubling the dose of DTG, our precious DTG will be lost due to the subtherapeutic blood level. Any PLHIV co-infected with hepatitis B will receive additional TL if not already receiving. So uh, uh, in these, uh, when we are doing these regimen changes, suppose we are going to DTG, ATVR, DTG, DR, DRVR, and we are not careful that the patient is having hepatitis B. In these cases, we really need to look into it. We have to add TL uh, in these cases to suppress hepatitis. Otherwise, the hepatitis viral load will go high, it will shoot up, and there will be liver damage. Now, the third line ART, the third line regimens should include new drugs with minimal risk of cross resistance to previously used ARVs. Third line ART will be formed by integrase inhibitors and a new boosted PI. The third line ART will be started by ART centers after receiving advice from SASTER of the respective linked ART center or the center of excellences. Now, the new third line is dolotegravir once or twice, I will come to that, with darunavir, ritunavir twice a day. And there is another addition to this. We have, uh, there is an addition to this. Uh, this is not included in this chart. We will be re re retaining one uh, NRPI backbone as, is the, uh, as has been recommended, but this will come into the uh, guidelines very soon that the new uh, NRTI backbone uh, will be um, uh, reinstalled with this regimen. Now, DTG will be used in once daily dose if DTG rel was never used in the first or second line ART regimen. Uh, we have a uh, small star close to twice a day DTG dose. That is, if a patient had failed on DTG in the first line or a second line regimen, then if we need to continue DTG in the third line, the dosage will be twice daily. Any PLHIV co-infected with hepatitis B, as I said, will always be, always be receiving an extra dose of TL. Now, coming to the revised third line guidelines, here uh, again we have the failing first line. We need to look into the failing first line. Then the next column will be the failing second line. And the third column will be the recommended third line. Now, the failing first line is either ZL, SL, TL, AL, that is all our NNRTI, along with, a, oh, sorry, all our NRTI with NNRTI. Now, the second line was any of the NRTIs with PI. The third line recommended will be darunavir, ritunavir, that is boosted darunavir with dolotegravir plus existing NRTI backbone. So this needs to be remembered. 
uh, but this is only the job of the ARP plus center or the CO is basically not not at the ARP center level. So the, the ART centers will receive the guideline, will receive a final decision from the COEs or the SASF. So what we need to do is we will be keeping one existing NRTI backbone. Now, which backbone we will keep is a determining, uh, is has to be determined by SASF or the COE as uh, um, because uh, we will be choosing from the first line or the second line, which was the lesser exposed uh, NRTI which was the NRTI where the adherence gaps were lesser or the viral load, uh, the, the sustained viral load was also lesser. That is a patient on a sustained viral load for a long time. Often it happens that the patient is failing for more than three years, failing for more than two and a half years. So in those cases, what happens is the number of mutations accumulate and that NRTI just goes away that we just have no hope of using it again. So we will look into these issues. If a, changeover from a failing regimen was done very sharply, we will choose that NRTI as the backbone. Now the failing first line, again, we will come into the NRTI plus in an RTI, that's the failing first line. And second line was in an NRTI with DTG. The third line recommended will be darunavir boosted with ritonavir, then DTG will be twice daily plus the existing NRTI backbone. So what we have seen is, uh, previously, I also spoke on this issue that if a patient is having a um, DTG in his first line or second line, and he is being recommended third line DTG also, then the dosage will be always twice daily. The third row is the NRTI with PI, that is the failing first line. Second line is NRTI with DTG, failing second line. Those patients will move to darunavir ritonavir plus DTG also again twice daily, plus existing NRTI backbone. That is, as I said, dolotrogravir will be twice daily. I, I, am, I am repeating this again and again because these are the new changes and these are really things we need to remember. Dolotrogravir has to be twice daily because you know there are, uh, we suspect small, small mutations, not the major ones, only the minor ones with dolotrogravir that are creeping up. To suppress those mutations, we need a very high and good level of dolotrogravir in the blood. So that is the reason we are giving dolotrogravir as twice daily. That is the third row. And coming to the fourth and the final row, we have NRTI and PI as first line, and failing first line. We have NRTI with darunavir ritonavir as the failing second line. This, this is a scenario because uh, before the introduction of dolotegravir, we really had no other choices. Before the introduction of dolotegravir and raltegravir, when the patient had intolerance to an NRTI and had failed on PI, we had to really shift to darunavir as the second line. So there are a couple of patients, a small cohort of patients who are on second line with darunavir ritonavir. And the, 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 this, uh, these patients we used to call as the alternate second line or the alternate, uh, that is the alternate second line having the first line regimens, first line like regimens. So uh, the, the, these patients who were on darunavir ritonavir, they will be shifted to darunavir ritonavir and DTG is with the existing NRTI backbone. So uh, what we can see is we are continuing with darunavir ritonavir similarly in the last column, in the last row. And we are just adding dolotegravir. So from this one line, we can we really know how how much we rely on dolotegravir because this patient has failed on darunavir. But why are we giving darunavir again? Because I said uh, um, uh, going back to my graph that the PIs have a very high genetic barrier. Even after few mutations, they still keep on working. So we can continue with darunavir even if it shows some amount of failure. And dolotegravir is the magical drug which will really suppress the viral load in such a fast and such a speedy manner that it will always help the, uh, the partial, even if the darunavir is partially acting, it will still suppress the uh, patient's third line regimen. Now the latest guidelines about the children, as we know uh, that, uh, the WHO recommends dolotegravir as the preferred first line for all the children in the age group of more than six years. Because of limitations in the widespread availability of pediatric formulations in India, the pediatric ART technical that is TRG group recommends the following regimens 
based on the age and the weight of the children. Now, uh, as we know that if the weight is less than 20 kg or the age is less than six years, we will go for ALLPVR. I'm using the abbreviation, sorry for that. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's easier to uh, talk like that. And if the weight is between 20 to 30 kg and the age is between six to 10 years, we will go for ALD. And if the weight is more than 30 kg and the age is more than 10 years, we will go for TLD. So lesser the age, we go for the PI. Middle age group, we go for the ALD. And if, if more than 10 years of group, then we'll go for tenofovir at a rate. But we really need to remember that if we are giving tenofovir to adolescent children, we have to add calcium, vitamin D3 supplements for their bone growth. This is needed because Tenofovir to some extent causes demineralization of the bones. And if we do not add the calcium and vitamin D3 supplements, the child may be stunted. Now the common, uh, the, the same thing with the charter, uh, we have to go through the age of the child when we are starting his her, her regimen. If less than six years or less than 20 kg, we'll go for ALLPVR. If between six to 10 years, we'll go for ALD. And more than 10 years, we will go for uh, TLD. But if a patient is more than 10 years uh, but having some amount of renal compromise, the, then again we'll go for ALD as the preferred regimen. Now the latest guideline, uh, I have gone through this several times. I'll again uh, re recapitulate. Thus, uh, children who are on rifampicin containing uh, ATT regimen will get an additional dose of Doldragravir. Like uh, the same child having ALLPVR will get to no, but we know that ALLPVR for PI based regimens, we give the super boosting with the one is to one ratio of return away. So, what we do is uh, our lopinavir return away is like it's a four is to one ratio, three is to one ratio, sorry. But here we will go for no, it's four is to one ratio, and we are, here we will make it one is to one ratio. So, we will be doing a super boosting of return away. And for our children between uh, 20 to 30 kg and 6 to 10 years of age, we will give an extra dose of Doldragravir after 12 hours. That is, we'll ask them to take a morning dose of Doldragravir and same with children above 10 years. Now the PEP guidelines, uh, NACO has also recommended Doldragravir as one of the choices drugs for PEP. We know that TLD is the PEP uh, drug of choice. Now, now it has to be given for 28 days at a stretch and one tab needs to be taken immediately or within two hours of exposure and uh, we need to continue that same drug up for another 27 days at a total 28 days of regimen for PEP. And for PEP for children is slightly tricky because we cannot give uh, dolotogravit to the smaller children. So for the smaller children, we will be giving lopinavir ritonavit. And for children aged more than six years and more than 20 kg weight, we can always go for dolotogravit. But we cannot give TL again to children less than 10 years of age. For those children, we have to give basically a and lamivudin. Uh, ZL is recommended. It is also in the slide and in the guidelines. But uh, ZL is hardly available in anywhere in the program. And it's not even available in the market nowadays. So uh, it's difficult. And we should always also look into the availability issues. If ZL is available in the program, uh, anywhere it is available in, with our ART centers, that is a pediatric uh, dosage then we can give, but if uh, the it is not available, we can smoothly go for ALLPVR or ALD, whichever is the case. Now, uh, I will not discuss about this slide because Altegravir is almost not there. Uh, now coming to the screening monitoring at every visit, we know that body weight treatment adherence, clinical monitoring for OIs, lab evaluation, and CD4 count viral load, these all need to be uh, seen. Um, at every, uh, at every visit, we see the body weight treatment adherence and the clinical monitoring for OIs. And uh, a routine mind, uh, blood testing uh, for uh, CBC, the complete blood count, the liver function test, the renal parameters, the fasting sugars, and uh, preferably the um, uh, lipid profile if the patient is on the protease inhibitors. These need to be seen every six months or if the symptoms direct us. And the CD4 count and, uh, has to be done at six months. And, at 12 months, and the viral load needs to be done. After starting the first line, we will do the viral load at six months of age and then every 12 months. But if the patient is on second line or third line, then we will do the viral load every six months. And we need to coordinate the CD4 also with the viral load 
initially the cd4 will be done uh, maybe done at the baseline but after that we will coordinate and do the cd4 as and when with the viral load and also that no this is it i don't want to discuss uh, basically it has been taken away from the program the viral load testing for plhiv already on ert viral load test should be done before transition to a newer regimen and patients should have completed at least six months of ART on any ARV regimen. And those who are virally suppressed, all transitions to be done after a single suppressed viral load. So uh, what we say is uh, for all these transitions, if a transition is happening without failure, that the only one single viral load should be documented before that. And if a patient is virally not suppressed, then we uh, will go for three month adherence step up counseling for those patients. And only after 95% of adherence we will do a second viral load. And after the second viral load, we will decide about the regimen with the, after discussion with, with the SASIP. Now the counselors at the ART center, they need to remember that uh, women of the childbearing age, they need to be uh, counseled about the neural tube defect or issues with the uh, women who are being started on doldragravid based regimen. Uh, also doldragravid, as I said, it gives rise to, uh, uh, it, it causes weight gain. And uh, diet control, slightly excess, uh, modify, modifying the lifestyle modifications and going for exercises should be encouraged. And uh, why we are changing the drugs? Because often our patients tend to question us that I am doing fine on this regimen. What? Uh, why are you? Why? Why do you need really need to go for this transition? So we need to tell them. Dolutegravir has a very sparse suppression rate. It is a very good drug. Minimum amount of drug interactions. And so this is the preferred choice nowadays worldwide. Now, uh, the information which we are telling patients can also be disseminated by the uh, posters and uh, printed, printed uh, IEC materials, information materials. We can also help our medical officers and our staff also with checklists and ready reckoners and flip charts. And uh, this patient information sheets uh, can be uh, and they, they can be kept ready at the ART centers and the patients can flip through them uh, if they have any query. And that's the end of my discussion. I hope it was understandable to everyone. And if you have any questions, uh, I'm, I'm ready to answer them. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, participants can now unmute their mics if they have any questions. Yeah. I don't think they have any questions in the chat box. No? There are no questions in the chat box. No? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, we have our COESTM email ID. That's COESTM1 at the rate of gmail.com. Uh, uh, because often it happens that uh, some of our attendees, they're not able to attend the live sessions. They go through the sessions of the uh, PPT afterwards. If you have any questions, you can always call me. You can uh, email and I'm there to answer all your queries. Thank you for patient listening. Thank you, Sveta. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, can we conclude the session now, ma'am? Thank you, sure. Yeah, thank you, ma'am.